And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Spell Scorched, which we'll be talking about. Some of you may know him as Pete Nut Butter. I gotta love that name. The one and only Pete Florian. How you doing today, man? Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's good to be here. Um, yeah, that nickname was not m mine. It was, I was given to me by a friend. Yep. So, um, <laughs> though I ha I have to, given the location on the uh, listed on the Kickstarter, I have I have to ap apologize in advance if I end up making any um jokes at the expense of the of the Steelers, Penguins, or Pirates because I roast all three of them. I roast everybody. Oh, that's quite right. <laughs> oh. Of course, I do. Of course, when it comes to the Steelers, I don't even need to because I keep because I hear the Fire Canada cho jokes every week. Yeah. But I suppose the best place to start is the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, well, I guess it depends on how far back you want to go. But uh, the earliest I would go was I was probably 10 or even younger, and my older brother was, uh, oldest brother was playing Dungeons & Dragons, of course, probably three, third edition at the time, and uh, obviously said, you're too young to play, because <laughs> I was just a snot-faced kid. So uh, me and my other older brothers that are younger and closer in age to me decided, well, screw that, we'll just start making our own game. And really, that's kind of how it happened. It just became a thing for us, and we just, based on what tidbits we could learn from that and other games like Hero Quest and other, you know, similar games, we started to just sort of already homebrew our own games. It would be years later before I got into actual Dungeons and Dragons, and and then a whole bunch of others. So teach RPGs as people know, but that's where it started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly see that. Now, with that with that in mind, was what would you what would you say would be some of the um, inspirational material behind Spell Scorch? Like the whether it be film, whether it be television, whether it be video games, what have you? What what sort of things fill in the appendix N in that case? Oh, as far as inspirations, it's uh, it's too numerous to count. Uh, I, I take a lot of inspiration um, from you know the the general idea of approaching uh, combat more tactically. Mm -hmm. it, I can take that a lot from from things like Dungeons and Dragons, but more also stealing ideas from video games and other things where you, you take those ideas and war games. I play a lot of war games too, mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to target specific individual games, but you could see there's just a there's, some, there's a little bit of, of, of war games. And then, of course, the fiction aspect comes in real heavily. You know, obviously, I was a big fan of Lord of the Rings as a kid and any other fantasy novel series that I can get my hands on and just kind of merging these all into kind of create new way of doing things, combining all these different ideas. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with that in mind, would you say that Spell Scorched is more in dark fantasy or high fantasy? I categorize it probably as grim fantasy, so I guess dark fantasy. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, a pretty rough world out there. So yeah. Has anyone brought up Berserk to you while de while um, developing this? Only in passing. You can you can tell me about it though. Yeah. I w I would, but I d but um that's a lengthy conversation. <laughs> Shelve that. that Sounds good. <laughs> um, I will note one thing that I definitely appreciated within the um, within the core but within the um, digital starter that's available on drive through RPG is the fact that you do have book you do have bookmarks and you have hyperlinks on the table of contents there's not as many not as many games um, do that well I, that's I'm glad people actually notice because sometimes people don't even try clicking on them and I have to like tell them hey click on the thing yeah <laughs> there's also hyperlinks links all throughout the book mm -hmm. uh the various things throughout the book you'll see a little underline you can click on it um and not only that I, I really try and make the game easy and as possible as accessible as possible things are laid out you got the table of contents and then i have like character creator spreadsheet where you can just click everything on a drop down make your whole character like 
try and make things as streamlined as like barrier proof for the new player as possible. Yeah. Now, as I understand it, within the myriad ways to roll dice, you are go you are going with d6 exclusively. Oh. D6 is exclusively correct. And I believe you're going with a with a roll with a roll high sum with um an exploding effect. Yes, it's a little bit different than what you might know as ex normal exploding dice, um, because if you're rolling a 3d6 roll, you have to get all sixes to start exploding effectively, so we call it cascading to differentiate it. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that that's even remotely feasible is it also uses a stacking advantage mechanic. So the advice that you, the dice that you actually use are the ones that determine whether you're cascading or not. Yeah, I can, and with advantage and disadvantage, it's a case of adding additional one, adding additional one and dropping the lowest or highest. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I, sp I suppose one of the key, one of the key things I should ask, given that, is is it a case where you're only ever going to get one advantage or disadvantage, or can you get stacks of it from absolutely sources? stacking? I've, I've seen people roll as much as seven, eight, maybe nine disadvantage at a, or advantage at a time. Well, and, that'll be good for know, the dice goblins. Yes, the dice goblins love it, and it is even more because once you get all those advantage, you're most likely going to cascade. So you better get some more dice going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the, now one of the other things I noticed is that you you only have you only have four core you only have four core attributes. Absolutely. Um, instead yep. instead of some games that have six, you've got physique, speed, will, and focus. Correct. Um, yeah, I wanted to keep the attributes tight, and uh, they're all extremely well balanced. It's probably the most balanced attributes I've seen in the game. Not to like toot my own horn, but it's a a thing that I beat to death. Um, so you, you have your speed, and that's sort of like your agility. But the, all the attributes do about three things. So the every character needs every single attribute. You can make a character of any class with any attribute spread, and it'll still be functional and actually can be quite strong as long as you just play the attribute strength. You know, if you got good physique, your weapon damage is going to go up. And you're gonna be a little bit tankier. If you got good speed, you're gonna be harder to hit, and you're gonna have good initiative. If you got good will, you're gonna be harder to batter. We'll get into that later. And have higher initiative and focus is just your pool of power, which is your resource. You might call it MP, AP, or something in another system. It's all your special abilities. And I I did notice that you have um, fortitude, evasion, and resolve for both for both physique, speed, and will. And it's um. Those particular static defenses, I know some people would bring up 4E. I will bring up Star Wars Saga Edition because that's where I first saw mm -hmm. that concept. Same, actually, yeah. Um, I initially just had Evasion, and then it, it came apparently early in the playtest. Like, oh, we we kind of need other options here. Uh, so it, I just added the other ones in rather than doing the other way. And part of that is because of the battering system. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you want me to get that into that now. or Yeah, let's get into that. Okay, yeah, the battering system is, I, as far as I know, it's it's pretty unique to the system. Um, it's uh, conceptually, anytime an enemy, anytime a creature gets hit, they could get wounded or they could get battered, or either or both, neither or both. Um, effectively, there's a little little multi-step process, but basically, and you take damage if it beats your batter threshold, you get a battering point, point. Um, and battering points lower your defenses for future attacks. So. As the fight goes, you'll usually take a hit or two. You'll be able to soak it, no problem, but you might get battered. And then eventually, boom, you get wounded. And it's three wounds and you're out. So it can be pretty deadly if you don't rally to get rid of your battering points. And that's the whole point of the whole battering system is to make it so your defenses can fluctuate up and down. So you might be at death's door one moment and then get something off heroically, get a cheap rally for part of your class abilities, mm -hmm. and then now you're winning. Yeah. And... What I, the closest analog I can think of is is that escalating penalty setup for the for the, that was in um that was in Saga Edition. You take damage mm -hmm. over a certain threshold, you get a es, you get an escalating all action penalty, and you you get hit with that too many times, and you're out. Which um, Fantasy Craft used something used something similar. Just just with um, a five phase setup, both of them were built so that even if you have ridiculous high amounts of HP, there's still a way to take you out. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Yep. One thing I would point out about battering points is, as opposed to those other types of systems is it only affects your defenses. It doesn't affect you anything you do offensively. So you might have you know six or eight battering points, but uh, until you get to the point where you get exhausted, it doesn't do anything defensively. So you can just keep fighting and hope you don't get one shot on your <laughs> before your next turn. Yeah. Now, the other thing the other thing I could I couldn't help but notice is the way you have this relationship between roles and specializations to almost create almost allow people to create a custom class if i'm reading this right yeah so actually it's funny it was initially a custom class but then i decided you know what let's make all these classes have their own abilities so you pick a role which is there's four roles mm -hmm. yeah you have the juggernaut which is your tank heavy armor plate armor then you have the bruiser which is your beefy fighter and, and male armor and then you have your striker which is more your roguish archetype and of course the caster in your cloth armor and you have those four roles. Those are the archetypes that kind of just fit across anything in any fiction. You can pretty much pick any character from any book or movie or anything. Say, hey, that's a striker. Hey, that's a you know bruiser, juggernaut, whatever. Yep. And so, and then you you take the actual meat of any any type of class, like berserker, and you put that on any one of those roles, and it becomes its unique class. Mm -hmm. And there's 15 specializations, so 15 times four is 60. So yep. 60 actual classes, and every one of them gets their own couple abilities that you can only get as that class too. Yeah. Now, given that, um, I know who I am, so I ha so I have to delve into this. If somebody wanted to do the the typical monk archetype, you know, the the unarmed mm -hmm. the unarmed fighter who's really good at hit at hitting a bunch of times, um, how would they do that within the role and specialization system that you have? Well, I actually have an in-world monk parallel. That is, uh, it's called the Physicator. Basically, they have uh, sort of like Captain America's super super strength kind of thing going on, um, so that you can go around and punch things. So you'd be a Physicator. The it's funny you mentioned the Striker Physicator is actually called the Monk. I try to use a lot of common classes so people get the idea. Um, and one of their and one of their unique class abilities is uh, actually to make extra attacks with their unarmed attacks. So it's right right in there. Yeah. Now. I did. I I did notice that you do have a feat system, but one of the things I definitely appreciate is having categorization for feats. That's always been one of my pet peeves. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They're all separated uh, nice and neat. Not only are they separated by type, mm -hmm. so um, well, actually, for, for starters, I should mention that all the feats feats are a combat ability. Your character can't take anything for a feat. To get you, you know, any kind of roleplay of a benefit. Everything in the game is separated so that your character should never have to sacrifice combat proficiency for any roleplay advantage. They're completely separated, so you're not making a trade-off between being good at RP or good at combat. So all your feats are combat abilities. So given that, most feats fall under like weapons or weapon style and things like that. And not only do they are they separated into those categories, they're sub-separated by weapon. So like all the axe feats right here. And so you can see what you get if you invest into axes without having to flip through 15 pages. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, I did also notice that the feet, that the feats are fair, fairly light in terms of their prerequisites. There's prerequisites for for a, for a few things, usually in having a certain skill or having a attribute at a cer at a certain threshold. But I, unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, the idea of feats. Requiring other feats as prerequisites is minimal. Yeah, other than feats that are directly in their chain, like so, like the second X feat might, might require the first X feat. Yeah, they're absolutely the chains don't interconnect very much. It's pretty much linear. I want to invest in this, so I'm gonna invest in this, and you get a feat every level. Hmm. So and and the, the linear chains are only three deep. So you're yeah. gonna be able to invest in at least three if you want. Um, so it's. Not heavy on prerequisites. Everybody should be able to use anything. So mm -hmm. if you want to play a caster and use a great sword, go right, go right ahead. And you know, there's ways to do that and be very effective. Yeah. So there's plenty of there's plenty of means to do gish. Um, it's just that mm -hmm. my my whipping boy when it comes to what not to do with prerequisites is always the um, the whirlwind strike feat in 3E and Pathfinder. Just because of the sheer amount of stuff you need to do, oh, it was like to spring do. attack and everything. It was it was awful. And for all intents and purposes, <laughs> it's the spin attack that you see in Legend of Zelda. That's what that's what whirlwind yeah. attack is. Yeah. And yeah, 
the idea of I can under I could understand needing that level of train of training if you're going to be doing that sort of spinning attack with say a sword, but it gets a little bit ridiculous if you're expected to have that level of prerequisites and some and somebody's using say a spear or a st or a staff, you know, two-handed things mm -hmm. that are meant to be sweeps. So and spell scorch, that's a fantasy that we know that players like. And so one of the roles, that's a, that's a key role ability. The bruiser just gets that. Mm. Level three, you're going to be whirlwind on your way through the battlefield. They also get a ranged option too, so it's, you can do ranged attacks too for volley and whirlwind. And unless unless I'm mistaken, you're you're not going to be as um, restrictive when it comes to dual weapon. When it comes to um, two weapon fighting. No, you can use whatever. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's not a two handed weapon, and there's actually things for that in playtest. I'm pretty, I should I'm mention sure. there's another there's another dozen specializations which makes like forty some classes already made that aren't in going to be in the core rulebook because they're they're still playtesting. Yeah. Now that brings me to spe to spell casting, and I I there's a few things that I see in here that I do um cert that I do certainly appreciate. Obviously, one of them is the fact that you're using essentially an MP essentially an MP system with fo with power and focus. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is that is that from what I'm from what I'm seeing, it's not it's not exactly in the same it's not exactly in the same um, fire and forget or having to prepare your spells. If I if I haven't made it obvious enough, I don't like the fancy in model. I never have. Yeah, I always hated it. Um, I'm not um, I'm not sure what your issue was. Maybe, maybe it was the same as mine, but mine was just it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the type of fantasy that it's trying to go for. Mm-hmm. Because if your character knows how to do magic, why do they just forget the spell after they cast? <laughs> I know why it's there because they, because Gygax and Arneson were big fans of the Dying Earth books by Jack Vance. Hmm. Which is funny that the Dying Earth RPG that Pelgrane put out doesn't even use that. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem, the pro the overall problem is just rationalizing that whole eight-hour rest thing. Yeah. Uh, but as I, and I suppose this is as good a time to, to mention that, unless I'm misreading this, you are using a action point system for the action economy. Instead, right. instead of instead of like a swift action, base, stand, standard action, move action, what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything has an action point cost based on roughly how long it should take, and that's a big balance point for weapons because mm -hmm. you have you know you have great swords that do big damage, but they're going to cost you I think eight action points, and then you have things like a dagger which is going to do far less damage but only cost you four action points. Now the extra little layer of intricacy there is, is sneaking in under the radar is that if you're only going to roll one die of damage for the dagger, your chances of effectively cascading are much higher than if you have to roll four dice and get all sixes. It's much easier to roll six on one die, especially when you get a few advantage. So, so it's a case, it's a case of a, a dagger is going to be able to have more spike damage, but not be able to be yes. as consistent with it. Whereas somebody with a bigger weapon is going to be able to do more damage, but the damage is going to be far more consistent i guess it's going to be consistent but less frequent mm -hmm. now the striker role is all about uh, encouraging people to want to get their damage rolls to cascade so they have a passive built in right at level one where their damage rolls they can cascade on five and sixes mm -hmm. so with that dagger you already just flat have a one in three chance of you know cascading from the start you throw in a couple advantage and you're usually going to cascade yeah. is it going to be doing enough you know that's up to the enemies mm-hmm the other the other thing when it comes to spells that, that I noticed is the is the fact that you have a bunch of different um, um categories for categories for them is is it a case where a class might have a feature where they where they learn a particular um cat a particular category just as one of their features yes yes so like base caster class the spells are separated into elements which will be familiar to pretty much anybody so the base caster class gets access to the four core elements you know air earth fire water and uh other other specializations will get uh access to things like life and death and other one-off things which is one of the specializations is a time walker so they do have time magic right there in the rule book mm-hmm 
And when it comes, the other th the other thing I noticed is, of course, things like empowering and um ch and channeling to make. Sh Would it be fair of me to say that, especially with those two elements, that you're trying to not have spells be a fire and forget um, affair? No, absolutely not. Your spells, you learn, uh, you can, uh, you know, if you pick a caster roll, you'll learn spells every other level. Um, but the ones you pick at level one will be useful all the way to the end of your character's career. Yeah. Um, you, as you get higher in level, you unlock access to empower them. So you spend an additional power and then you get more damage mm -hmm. for the damage spells. Other spells have different effects like levitate later becomes fly after you empowered a couple times. Mm -hmm. Um, so the spells all scale up as you empower them and they have greater effect. They might have increased duration. Um, things like that. And then uh, let me just hop into the spell mod system. So all of the spells are um, usually like the base form. So there's only one really fire spell, and it's called Fire Blast. Simple. It doesn't cost you any power, just action points. So you can pew pew all day. Uh, but you can combine all your spells with any spell mod you know. So this goes back to you have a list of things you can do with your toolkit. So you might have like seven spells or so but then you also have things that are spell mods that can alter your spell so that fire blast if you put a burst mod on it it becomes a fireball if you put an enchant mod on it you make you or your, one of your teammates weapons flaming mm -hmm. and there's just i think there's like 25 mods in the core rule book to just completely alter the way the spell interacts with the battlefield and it's only limited by the spell types like damage spells have different mods that available to them than compared to like support spells oh when it comes to spell mods, would there be a potential option to, to say, turn a, st a standard single target elemental spell to have a chain effect, for instance? Yep, chain chain is a mod. <laughs> so, um, cha I'm not saying chain fireball because that would be ridiculous, but just cha but chain a a single, um, a single shot into one that keeps one that keeps going the way chain yeah, lightning so does, just not limited to lightning. Sometimes people get the wrong idea whenever they hear me talking about the spell mod system. They think it's like all rules light, you can do whatever you want. It's actually extremely structured. So whenever you apply a spell mod to a spell, it has a required type, and then it has a type it becomes. Mm -hmm. So if I were to take a fire blast, it requires the damage type, and then it becomes area control. Mm -hmm. Anytime a spell's area control, you can't do anything else to it pretty much other than stretch the area to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. So you can't take a burst and then chain it because it's just that's two different things to give it area control. But you yep. could chain it, or you could burst it, or you could line it, or wave it, or cone it, or, like I said, lots of other things. Or put it into a rune as a trap. Or <laughs> Oh, I'm very familiar with, with rune traps, especially given the infamous up button that I've used, um, which started out because I wanted to make a, I wanted to make a rogue who was more about um, setting up ridiculous traps, then disabling traps, nice. and the idea is you step on the you step on the thing, you go straight up, um, at about <laughs> at at about thirty miles an hour for six seconds. It's a and, lift. And this is a halo thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one just one that goes straight up, and that is it is very deadly to use indoors, because again, you're going thirty miles an hour straight up. And there's no rule that there's no rule that says it stops if there's something in the way. No oh, yikes. So, 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 I think there was one case where a dragon ended up stepping on the trap in a room lined with adamantite and got crushed to death. That's awesome. Because well, something like this isn't <laughs> going to care how heavy it is. There's no rule that yeah. that says it can that says it's going to be doing less if the thing is over a certain weight. No, it doesn't matter if you're um, 30 pounds or 300 pounds, you're going up for six seconds. I like it. Oh. Some of that was by accident because I didn't put those qualifiers in. And mm -hmm. when I finally realized it, I'm like, I'm not going to tell him that. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. Hope nobody notices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, so runes, you can put any spell pretty much uh, into a rune of some sort. And uh, a big, runes are actually a big part of the, the lore in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Runes actually directly interact with the physics of the world. So if, if you, as any old magicless you know, layperson, were to draw the rune in the right way, it would have a semi-magical effect. In other words, it can interact with elements. So if I put a, a fire word rune on, say, the book, and this is actually a thing that's in the book, mm -hmm. um, it'll protect the, rune, the book from burning up. So if you looked at the book and it's got that whole burning effect, that's because it was protected by a fire rune after being in a fire. So mm -hmm. um, You also have clockwork, 
So I'm curious if you're if that's going to be used as a way to allow players to create custom inventions or gadgets or what have you. So I do have Clockwork partly because it felt weird to have a whole entire specialization. And in fact, the the NPC that talks to you in the book is himself a time walker. So it feels weird to have all this time stuff without having clocks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Clockwork is in there. Um, and there is actually a specialization that's been out for a while in playtesting called The Inventor, which just has this giant list of inventions that you can choose from. And it's probably going to be even larger by the time I put it into the next book. Mm-hmm. And, of course, when it comes to magic, since we're going with a um, darker fantasy and in those kind of settings, magic usually has its own risks. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about the fading. Yeah, so fading is what happens to people whenever they cast magic too much, too, too, too much strong magic of any element. Um, it gradually makes you become what you're casting. So if you if you cast too much fire spells, you'll slowly start to get the whole hair on fire look, and until eventually you could just lose your mind and your body and become a fire elemental. Um, and the and the trick is that you know skilled people can balance. This is the only reason elements are divided. The spells are divided into elements, by the way, mm -hmm. is because a skilled caster can cast some water magic, and it just counteracts the fire fading, and then you're back to where you started. But the trick, the catch, I guess, is that the element wants you to keep going. So you have to make a check to be able to do that. And then the, the further you fade, you get mechanical benefits. Um, so you're better. So if I fight, fade, fade hard into fire, my fire spells are going to get two advantage on damage. And I'm just going to be blowing stuff up. But <laughs> it gets harder and harder to resist the urge whenever you try and cast a water spell. The element might be like, oh, I failed the check. No, I'm going to just go. I'm just going to go all the way to seven. And seven's where you lose your character, at least until you can your teammates can try and save you. But uh, Mm -hmm. They have a round to save you once you turn into an elemental, so yeah, it's always an event. But it looks like you also have ways of of using power for ev for even non casters with the heroics system. Yeah, not only heroics, but all. Uh, so because everything is mix and match between the role and the specializations, like a berserker's rage costs one power, mm -hmm. things like that. Every ability costs power. Uh, the paladin smite, the slayer smite. Uh, but yeah, heroics is a a neat little thing that I came up with just to get a little bit more of things that you find usually more in rules like games um, where the player gets a little bit more say as to what happens in the game. Now, the, the first one's pretty widespread. It's called luck. Everybody kind of knows how that works. You, it just gives you an advantage if you would fail a roll. You, you get another chance. You can mm -hmm. try and get another shot. But there's other ones that are cool, like Hint Here, which is if you're ever puzzled on a, on a puzzle or any other thing in an adventure, you can just spend two power and the GM has to come up with a way to give you a hint via the universe, whether it's like an NPC shows up to help or something like that. And then I plan for this as another heroic where you can spend some power and say, look, I knew I was coming out here. My character would have planned for this. So I'm spending two power and saying, I planned for this. And I would have done all of these things. I would have purchased a healing potion. I would have brought rope. I would have, you know, whatever it is that would have made practical sense. Mm -hmm. And given, given what you mentioned about the hint, the first thing that came to mind is the hint button in every Sierra adventure game. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like that. It's a bit like the hint button. I have run uh, at several uh, puzzle exclusively, like puzzle only adventures, which is puzzle after puzzle after puzzle, and the players get fatigued, and then they just start spending power <laughs> to get hints because they're mentally fatigued. And then I feel bad whenever I throw the big boss at the end, and they have no power left. So, mm -hmm. but I don't really feel bad, you know. As you, as you shouldn't. <laughs> Though. With that, with that in mind, I also couldn't help but notice the lengthy um, skill list that you have, including the fact that weapon use is a skill, which I will always... That's always be one of the things I will appreciate in these systems. Instead, instead of just having it be its own, its own separate thing, no, it's something you have to, do, you have to um, develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, each weapon, each weapon, weapon attacks effectively are skill roles. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's also to keep them distinct from the, the spells, which is each element is a skill. So there's just kind of like one for one there. Yeah. And yeah, there's an extensive skill system. Um, it really, I feel like it's a way to sort of give everybody their own identity. It's like, I'm good with this and I'm good with that. And I feel like that's good. It, if, it helps keep everybody in the party in their own sort of role. And the neat thing, though, is since your skills aren't given to you by your role or specialization, you could be any role on any specialization and take any of the skills. So you don't need to be, oh, just because I'm the charisma character, so I'm the party face. Like, there's none of that. All the skill roles are separate from attributes. So again, it goes back to what you're good at in combat 
doesn't have to interfere with your role play. They're completely just separate. Which is good because I've I've seen far too many games that try and um try and put try and put a try and put skill points on certain archetypes, which leads leads to a bit of disconnect when you have martial characters who that's the only thing that they're good at. So whenever all I can do is jump. <laughs> yeah, all you can all you can do is jump. All you can do is jump and. It leads to long stretches of them just checking their phones whenever combat isn't a thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to rag on D&D, but you literally have a class called Fighter, and that's all it does. So, I mean, that that's not a thing in Spell Scorch. Your, your character has the same array of skill options as everybody else. Well, let's, cons- let's, consider, the cl- let's consider the character that the fighter or the barbarian is, bu- is built around, Conan. Mm-hmm. Conan, despite despite being a barbarian, is not is not just all about fighting. Oh yeah, he's got stealth and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, he's been a thief. He's been a, he's been a pirate. He's been a ruler. Um, <laughs> he has been he has been yeah. a barbarian. But that but and each and each one of those things is going to have its own se- separate skill set that he's di- that he's dipped into, and that's just with one example. If we a lot of people look at um, Aragorn as the prototypical ranger archetype, and well, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that he's a, that he's able to do in the, in um, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this there's this there's this idea that um, the martial classes shouldn't be doing a whole lot of skills because that's for the skill monkey. I I'm of the belief that having somebody as a dedicated um, martial character or a dedicated skill monkey is part of the problem. I mean, yes, you I have 100% people agree. fulfilling those roles, but you should the whole party should be getting involved in one form or another, not just yeah. the specialist. Absolutely. I actually even have a this is uh, if you don't mind, I have a thing called the skill summary challenge, mm-hmm. which is. This is one of my favorite things. And this actually came late in playtesting. It's effectively a montage mechanic. So if you ever have a situation where the players have to travel from point A to point B, and you want them to have a hard time doing it, but you don't actually want to have to play through all that, um, you have the skill challenge system. And if you ever have a player derail a session to do something that they should have to face serious consequences for, but you don't want to derail your own session, you have the skill challenge mechanic. So this the skill summary challenge is basically everybody in the party gets to roll one roll and you give them a series of, of a skill check for each player, but you don't tell who has to make it. You don't tell them what's coming next. So it's like, okay, you guys are running from this fight. I need somebody to make an endurance roll. And then somebody makes that. And you go down the line and tell the last player hopefully has the skill in question. And then <laughs> depending on how well they do, they can end the skill summary challenge with wounds or, or lost power, or they can come, come out unscathed. And it's a great way to sort of just montage resolve things it's just a really handy mechanic. Also, does Overland travel whenever you don't want everybody? Because there's a big problem in resting games where it's like you got two days off t- downtime because I don't feel like putting in random encounters. So you're going to have all your spell slots or whatever it would be. And and the skill challenge makes it so you show up worse off than when you, when you left town because you shouldn't be doing great when, you know, after traveling a week in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that said... I also, when it comes to the when it comes to the setting that you have, um, I the one the one element that we haven't dip that we haven't dipped into is um is the is the races. So I suppose I should ask what the what the um individual races bring to the table when doing character creation. Yeah, so um, I use the word peoples, mm-hmm. and j- basically because I always thought races was inaccurate, because uh, they are really different species, but I felt like the word species was a little bit too sci-fi sounding for a fantasy game. Um, so I went with peoples. I know like Pathfinder or whatever use ancestry. It might, you know, it doesn't so much matter. But there's uh, there's seven in the core book, and then I have another dozen or so out in play testing. Mm-hmm. Um, you have your human. Everybody, you gotta start there, I guess. Human, simple and basic. Um, but it's not really because the human thing is, in in Ada, is humans are they feel like they're the hero of their own life story more than anybody else, and so they get like a bonus to their luck heroic. It's cheaper for them to start off, mm-hmm. and a bonus to their survive heroic. 
and things like that. So and an extra skill, which is just fun, an extra, actually two train skills. Um, that's your that's your base point. And then the other ones are all original, all original peoples. You're not gonna see elves and dwarves or whatnot playing in spell scores. Although I did include them as variant options in the back. Um, so uh, the Unaki are sort of like this uh, ancient, powerful, magical race. They're mostly extinct and also converted into another one, which I'll tell you in a second. Um, they're uh, gold skin, tall, six fingers on each hand, mm -hmm. and uh, naturally magical. And you know, a little bit of the dark past that used to enslave all of humanity. So a little bit of tension there. Uh, <laughs> one thing the Unaki do is if they were ever like grieving or being punished by their own people, they would often go into like a, a long sleep and sort of uh, enter a sort of a cryo -sleep type sleep in a, in a sort of rune sarcophagus and then wake up centuries later. So if you're playing an Unaki, you're actually having this sort of out of time experience because you probably recently woke up into this world because Unaki are relatively extinct in the world other than those people because they became the accursed. Mm. which is what happened to the Anaki. Uh, unsure how it happened. Uh, the most accursed blame humans. And uh, they, they have this curse that makes it so their bones grow out of their flesh and leave open wounds and various places, no two are alike. And uh, a thing about both the accursed and the Anaki is they're really smart. They're, they're, by canon, the average accursed or Anaki is supposed to be like a genius level human. And so they have this thing where the accursed are now defeated by the humans and driven underground. So there's sort of like this outcast to society, which might fit like sort of like a drow or something, but they're also really smart. So they're always tricking the humans and doing all this cool stuff. And then there's a, there's a subset, of course, that want to make peace. And so it has this, this cool relationship between the two. Um, it's great for players to engage with it. Players always want to try and heal the, the past or, 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 you know, it's good stuff. Um, and then we have... A bunch of other oh the, the other main one is Amorians, and they they have a a strong connection the with uh, their own sort of emotions and, and adrenaline so that they get like super strong and fast whenever their loved ones are in danger, mm -hmm. and it's it's sort of like a hyper adrenaline kind of thing. Um, they look mostly human, but they can have different ha colors hair. So if you want to do your sort of anime look, if you want blue hair, go for it. <laughs> there's your there's your people. Um, and then we have the gremlins. They're, they're a little bit like goblins. They're small, kind of furry creatures. They they can eat almost anything, and they got a nice little bite. Um, and uh, and corrupted is sort of the catch-all for peoples. It's uh, people that were taken as usually as infants or whatever, and done magical experiments on. And now they can look like anything you want. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to make a character that looked pretty much like any other fantasy race in any other game, you can do it via the corrupted system. And they get options to get like a bite attack or any other natural weapon type thing. Mm -hmm. And I suppose this is as good a time to go, to go into how um, skills works because in several of the race entries you, and I'm just using races, just they have it thing. No, um, it's fine. You meant, you mentioned um, training. So is, was, is this the case where the idea of skill points in the traditional sense is not a factor? Yeah, so um, both attributes and skills in the game use a competency system, mm -hmm. um, which won't seem too familiar. I think uh, some, I'm trying to think. Of, I think Pathfinder 2e used a competency system. Um, but yeah, so you, you're either cursed, flawed, average, trained, exceptional, master, or legendary, in any skill or attribute. Mm -hmm. um, your characters are almost always going to have five attributes in total. So that could be like a master and an exceptional, or or four or three trained in an exceptional, you, you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the skills, your, your profession will give you a master in one, and then you'll be trained in a bunch of other ones. And it basically just gives you the starting number. They're all one apart to start going from minus two to plus five. And then over the course of 10 levels, they, they get two apart. So mm -hmm. masters plus eight and then exceptionals plus six at level 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, it's one of the, it's one of those things I'm always keeping an eye out for because, again, with sk with um, skill points, it ends up disincentivizing people to pursue a variety of skills, you know, sunk cost fallacy and all that. Yeah, yeah. So the way that whenever you level up, since there's no skill system, there's no skill points, but whenever you level up, you can bump the competency of any any skill, but no higher than exceptional. Mm -hmm. You get you have to take a feat if you want a skill to master, and you get two free skills to master. 
as part of your role at levels three and seven. So basically, you got average trained exceptional is the play range for most skills, and then whatever your profession gave you will make you a master. And some specs specializations they also give you master, and I think that you know aligns with the the lore and flavor of the specialization. Yeah. Now there are a few. There are a few. Fact, there are a few factions since you do have a faction system within the ga within the game, along with its own reputation setup, which I mm -hmm. do appreciate. It helps bring people into the world more. Uh, I'd like to kind of go into a few of them, a few of the factions there, and kind of get a vibe for how, for how they approach the setting. Yeah, sure. Um, let me look at the list here, so I'm not like talking on a turn <laughs> there we go um yeah so factions i mean i can let me just highlight a few here yeah um so a lot of the factions uh you know so first of all what is a faction well i mean it's it's sort of like a semi-political entity that isn't actually a political entity it's like they have their own agenda but they're not really aligned with any sort of nation state or anything mm -hmm. um so and uh most of them still have a, a base location which semi aligns them with somebody um so like the simplest one is probably the aegis of dawn they are your anti-undead faction and uh we didn't get too much into the setting but the the nation on the west coast is constantly assaulted by undead that come out of the sea uh so they need a lot of people that can kill undead <laughs> and that's what the aegis of dawn does um that's where they're that's where they're founded and that's where they're based um and they they reward you for killing undead and they all their missions will be about killing undead and helping people not become undead and things like that and uh the uh some of the more interesting ones the children of bell wonderful little faction they're very nice people i promise they are a <laughs> uh, a nation that was once called daltonia was destroyed in the war of a couple hundred years ago and they are the faction that is basically the remnants of the people that have descended from the refugees from that destroyed place um, and they they have unique access to the specialization known as the Grey Ghost. It's an all-original uh, class concept. Basically, these people can turn into toxic gas, um, mm -hmm. to, and they recruit people to undergo this process. It's effectively a corrupting process, kind of like making a witcher, um, and so it kills a lot of people. And uh, they often recruit children that are desperate and whatnot, so they have a bit of a bad rep, and they're also very uh, manipulative and whatnot. And when it comes when it comes to each one of them, is there a, is there a kind of guide for how you'd get or lose reputation with them? Yeah, every one of the factions has a simple breakdown right in the beginning: how you gain rep and how you lose rep. It doesn't just tell you how; it usually tells you an amount. So, um, you know, it's it's usually tied for like the Aegis. They want you to kill undead, so you get for every XP you earn killing undead, you get one Aegis reputation, and mm -hmm. it's as simple as that. And of course, of course, there would there wouldn't be much point of getting reputation or climbing up the ranks in organizations if you didn't get anything from it. And it looks like each of them has their own little rewards that you get from them. Is yes, at the highest. Go ahead. Is it a case where you get them at cer at certain thresholds, or is there a different approach? Yeah. So after a certain amount of reputation, you 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 are considered like uh, friendly, trusted, respected. And then you, you you hit that threshold, and then you get access to these new things. The highest ones, uh, once you get all the way to honored by them, they usually give you basically uh, what was is an epic feat. It's called epic specialization. It's basically a free multi-class into the specialization that they are sort of associated with, you know. Mm -hmm. So like the Aegis would give you the ability to smite and things like that. Mm -hmm. Fair, fair, which is fair since their whole thing is um, the only good. The only good undead is a destroyed undead. Absolutely. And the Slayer is a... The way I justify the existence... Because all religions in Spellscore Sineta are religions of faith. There is no... Your god doesn't give you power. So how do you smite undead? Well, you smite because you've also undergone a corruption process. Kind of like the Grey Ghost one, but very different. Uh, where your body is attuned to this sole purpose of killing undead. Your character is obsessed with killing undead. You <laughs> And you can smite undead. And uh, that's pretty much your main goal. So it's, it's sort of a mind and body altering effect that uh, changes the person. Mm -hmm. Which is which is all 
all fair, all fairly well and good. Now, on the there were in the material that I, that I had access to, there wasn't a whole lot when it came to um, monsters. So that that is one thing I sh I feel I should ask about. Yeah, so the core rulebook has the has the monsters in it. Mm -hmm. um, they are they are made via the um, they give you the competencies of each monster and what their special abilities are, and then there's a straight way that all monsters progress, where it's just flat stats. Uh, they have their abilities, and everything scales off their stats, so they get flat stats every level. So basically, I'm giving you the template for a monster. There's about 100 of them in there, monsters and monster templates. There's about 100 of them in there, and you can make it any level you want to balance it to fight the party. So... Like it'll say like, hey, this creature is you know has master physique, exceptional speed, what you know whatever it would be, and then here's how all monsters scale. You know. Yeah. So it's not like you're doing some challenge rating thing. Oh no, the monster system is incredibly easy, and I have to admit I completely lucked into this. Um, it's as simple as add up the level of the enemies and add up the level of the players, and they match. That's it. That's an even fight. And if you do that, it's. It's surprisingly how well it works, partially because of action economy and the way the, the competency system scales. I was shocked when it started working. I was like, what if I just threw one monster at them? That was all the levels added together. And I was like, wow, this extremely works. So yeah. it's extremely simple. Yeah, I've I've picked on the I picked on the challenge rating set setup most mostly because of the mm -hmm. fact that it relies on too many assumptions, specifically that 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 that's the rating if you're dealing with a balanced party of four. Yeah, it's... and what what is such a thing? Who who plays a balanced party of four? <laughs> uh, well, e even if people did, that's not an assumption you should be making. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, again with that whole least amount of assumptions thing we talked about before we went live. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, this is real simple. Mm -hmm. Let's add them up. Throw them at them. Yeah. So, what with that with that in mind, would you say that the idea the idea of an encounter budget would be would be would be the way it ends up go, ends up going in practice? Yeah, I don't know if it, I'd even really call it a budget. It's more just like, hey, there's four level two players. That means I have eight levels of monster. You could consider that a budget, but I mean, that's the sort of math that's so simple that you don't really need the budget. You just kind of like, oh, that's a level eight monster or two level fours. Like, you don't need to write that out or anything, you know. Maybe at high levels where the numbers get big, but yeah, pretty much. That's it. And, and there's other things you can throw into, like traps have a level two. So if there's traps built into the fight, uh, they scale right with the weight with the monster, things like that. Mm -hmm. The other... now the other thing I'd be curious about is if you have a means of doing cu of doing custom monsters. I do actually, yeah. It's also in the GM section, which is going to be in the core rulebook. Um, the it, it sort of breaks down uh, every type of ability that exists and how it works and how it scales, and then lets you allocate you know the abilities to each each type of monster, and then um, the whole monster system works off of type and subtype. So like the animal type gives you a certain thing, and then like the mammal subtype gives you a, a, another couple abilities. So the whole monster ability works on that. When you make a custom creation monster, you can kind of give it a subtype and a type, and you're already halfway there. And then you just gotta give it some of the other abilities from the custom list. Mm -hmm. Now, taking all that taking all that into account, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the project? Oh, it's done. It's 284 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's done. Um, we have books already coming to print, and as soon as it's uh, the Kickstarter's done, they'll be they'll be sent out. Mm -hmm. And I I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it de how it develops, and especially with especially with some of the customization I can see within it. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Hey, I appreciate the madness. Thank you for uh, <laughs> inviting me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say Sounds around good. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Might take you up on that. 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Thanks, everyone.